Hello, everybody. Now we are going to talk about Sonic Frontiers, where AI and tech heart converge with Aga Samitowska. Who is Aga? Ah, OK. Hello. Thanks a lot for hosting the panel. And we are also with Robin, Mathieu, uh, Mathieu's, okay. Daniel, and Christopher. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So yeah, it's a tough task uh, to have another AI panel by almost the end of the conference. I feel that everything has already been said. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to uh, take advantage of an amazing speakers that I have on this uh, panel and dig into their specific point of view on the subject. So we want to talk about like the space, what is actually happening around creativity when we meet AI technology and, and art. Uh, so yeah, could you could you um, could I invite you to uh, briefly introduce yourself so that we know what what you're doing? Sure. Um, so I'm Robin. Uh, just a bit of background with me. So I've got my masters in digital signal processing, where I also did my thesis in interactive sound installations. Um, I then also worked at Native Instruments, and I now work for a music AI startup, very very young startup, like a few months old, and that's me. Uh, so hi everybody, I'm Mateusz, uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Warsaw University of Technology where, where I do research in music AI, it's also where I did my PhD in music AI. I'm also the head of AI at Closer Music. Um, previously I've also worked at Apple at their music machine learning team. I've also been very fortunate to be a performing and touring musician for more than 10 years. Uh, and all in all, I care about uh, interpretable and explainable uh, AI and creative applications of the rough. And hi, my name is uh, Daniel. I come from uh, Norway. I'm a professor in uh, music and digitalization and how digitalization impacts music industries, music business. Uh, I did my, my doctorate on assessing how the infrastructure and dynamics of the music industry is being impacted by different types of, of new technology. Uh, I lead a project currently, an uh, 8 million euro project, on how we can use new tech in music education and higher music education. I come from music. I used to be a performing artist. I used to release music and, and tour. And I used to work with a major music festival for a long time. Uh, and I eventually ran it. We used to have David Bowie, Daft Punk, Coldplay, all the big touring acts. I ran it bankrupt, uh, I also shut down my band, and I left into academia, and I'm now a professor, yes. <laughs> Yay, good for you. Everyone, my name is Christopher Wiederwild, aka the AR Musicpreneur. I'm a former broke musician. Had a big dream when I moved to London 15 years ago. I had no direction as an artist. I basically failed, went bankrupt, uh, moved in there with my parents again. Uh, then I pivoted to product strategy, scaled a startup to 150K a month. Uh, I mean, I help actually help my mom um, become an author and sell 100,000 books. So that kind of uh, taught me about um, that life is about helping and uplifting others. So uh, I started the AI Musicpreneur uh, because I wanted to provide the tools, resources, and strategies I, I wish I had when I was a music artist. So I help artists with uh, the AI Music Manager, which is an uh, AI prompt library to create release strategies and content. And uh, you can visit it if you go to aimusicpreneur.com. And I'm very excited to be here. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, my name is Agasa Mitowska, and I'm based in Warsaw, Poland. I represent uh, Zaik's Lab, uh, which is a, a space for experimentation from Zaik's. Zaik's is a society of authors in, in Poland. And uh, my uh, background is in music business. I worked for over 10 years uh, in a record label as a music manager, head of digital distribution. So yeah, in brief, that's me. And uh, I wanted to kick off this panel with um, a simple, I don't know if it's a simple question. <laughs> question. Uh, what is the true power of AI? Like, would you say that it's creativity or rather perfectly mimicking creativeness, creativity of like a human, um, uh, human beings. Uh, so the, the follow-up question is, is it truly possible for AI to kind of think out of the box and create something truly inventive? 
any scientists are welcome. Let me ha let me take a stab at it. Uh, I think I think it's too early to to you know place verdict on it. Uh, I see our students and, and we have a lot of students who are most of our students are performing artists. They are they're performing musicians and. Uh, and they're super eager in, in trying to trying to test it, trying to you know find ways to use it. And, and but I think and I think in general, uh, my impression is that musicians and artists are in general super interested to test new tech. Uh, and um, what I see is that at, at this phase they're they're testing it. But I think AI and the usage of AI is going to be it's going to be different in only a few years when legislation kicks in when. When creatives have a bit of time to, to test, to, to, to find new ways to, to use stuff. Uh, so I think, I think it's too early to, uh, to say how it's creatively being used. You know, uh, I strongly agree with uh, the statement that uh, musicians are some of the most tech-savvy people around there. And they are always eager you know, to hop into new uh, methods of expressing uh, their emotions, like new instruments, new uh, VST plugins, new methods of composition, production, etc., etc. And uh, from some of the insights into um, musical AI, and when, when I'm speaking about musical AI, uh, when, when, when we're talking about that, what we're mostly talking about is neural networks. That's, that's, that's only one of the techniques used in AI, but it's like most of what's happening right now. And uh, neural networks, in the way they operate, they are often misconceived as these kind of machines that cut up existing data and just rearrange them, which is, which is totally not the case in how those uh, algorithms operate. What they actually do underneath is kind of create a abstract map or representation of the data that, have, that they have been uh, trained on. So I'd say I'd be more on the side of saying that, yeah, AI can get pretty creative uh, and that it can create this sort of like a compressed representation of what it was trained on and then use it for uh, some interesting purposes. Yeah, I think the real superpower in AI that I see is um, just processing the vast amount of data in a very, very rapid way. And we're seeing that uh, through music generation, um, splitting stems. A good example is uh, Emile Delaray, who um, coded an AI-assisted software, and he's, a, he's an engineer, to help uh, with the last Beatles track, the Now and Then, to split um, the kind of extract the piano and L John Lennon's voice that actually helped to create the final track. And I think where we are now is it's more like a narrow intelligence, it's, it's the n narrow intelligence phase, so we're kind of accessing the information about humanity that is existing. But once we get to the phase of, you know, general intelligence, AGI, that's when machines are really going to be able to have like cultural heritage, understanding and emotional understanding. And um, let's not talk about ASI with super intelligence. That's a whole different topic. <laughs> Did you want to? Uh, yeah, I, I'm. I think I see it quite a bit differently. I mean, I'm not disagreeing, but I see it that it's actually going to be more of a companion to people. I think people, as humans, we always want to break things. We want to take things one step further. So I see AI more being as like your co-producer with you in your DAW. So your audio software that you're using. Um, because you might say th something like, well, that's really cool, but like, how do we actually take this further and progress it a bit differently? Mm -hmm. The same way people would, like started using MIDI in the past, or people are using loops, they're changing, overlapping different genres. So I think it's just gonna allow us to take creativity to another level and break things and create things the way we're probably not doing now. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a really fun tool. <laughs> yeah, so in a, a recent report coming from Gamma and Sasa about AI, uh, we can read that um, uh, it can be assumed that by 2028, 27% of music creators' revenues will be at risk due to generative AI. And I'm kind of, yeah, I wonder what is your take on the if your assumption is similar, or maybe... Uh, we can we will see um, kind of um, 
not very direct uh, relationship between like um, AI and uh, human creativity. Um, I'm thinking about uh, this benchmark in photography or when photography was invented, like it had obviously an immense impact on painting. Uh, but it is when actually the abstract painting happened, started, the, the impression started. So it kind of uh, create a space for humans to be more creative because um, all of the burden burden of like um, using painting for realistic, uh, you know, like technical purposes was was taken from their shoulders. So yeah, I'm kind of in between. Like, what are your fun or your thoughts on that? Whoever wants to figure like you are. <laughs> everyone's doing Frank Zappa from now on. So just to just to separate from the streamlined. I, I, uh, uh, I think I, I think that there will be like a like a pendulum. So so at some point, you know, in order to to uh, to separate oneself from from uh, a more generative uh, sea of of musical content, I, I think that becomes uh, very important. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure how that m you were saying how much money uh, was being twenty seven percent. 27% increase, you know, decrease in a decrease, force, yeah. yeah, in revenue for it. I, do you know what that, what is that based on? Oh, it's based on, yeah, analysis, like the uh, Gamma and Sasem uh, hired uh, a company who did the uh, venture of analysis and yeah, but based on, on their local markets, uh, basically. Well, I think this again ties back to, to what I was saying earlier. It's too too early, uh, and I think uh, legislation will will put some some frameworks to to how uh, how AI can be used and also how AI can be licensed and and in what way uh, the economic models will will look like. And I think the the best example is uh, and I I do a lot of. Uh, Based on, on much of my research, uh, when we look at if we look back on how music tech uh, or technology into music has has gone into different phases, there's a kind of a repetition in, in, in much of it, and, and part of it, part of the repetition is as as you were saying earlier the the fighting and the uh, the negative approach, but there's also a another side of it which is the public and academic debate, which is very hyped up about it on and, and very hyped up about what it can do and it's very enthusiastic mostly on what is technologically possible and not necessarily what is creatively interesting but what is technologically possible and right now I think we're in the same phase where, where everyone's really enthusiastic about what is technologically possible and not really paying attention to what is creatively interesting uh, and I think this is where and, and we haven't come there yet the way I see and it's when we come there, we can see some, perhaps, hopefully, some, some interesting models, both business-wise and creatively. I think where the discussion is going to be interesting in is, so the ones using AI is not going to replace musicians, but it's going to replace someone that is not using AI to its full potential. And we're already seeing that, that people that are in a certain position, they're going to amplify their voice by using AI. So when I talk to artists and labels, for instance, um, what, what, I, what I tell them is basically you've got those traditional um, revenue streams that are in place, but you need to start building up new revenue streams that for audiobooks, for instance, and voice actors, that's clone your voice and put it on a marketplace so that people can use your voice because you cannot be in 10 places. You can still do your projects on the, on the site and work, you know, um, these uh, relationships that you already have do these jobs, but build up another revenue stream in the same way with publishing. So if you're signed um, to a publishing deal and you try to get your songs um, placed somewhere, use AI software to, uh, to split the song into the different stems and create variations because it's going to be easier to get placements for your songs based on different variations. One song might be good for a teaser, another song might be good for a documentary. And that just gives you more opportunities to get placements and get paid. Yeah, so we stepped up on um, human AI collaboration. I wonder, um, do you see any interesting tools? I want to ask each one of, of you about this, um, because I know that you are also engaged with, with, with some projects. So. Um, 
Uh, yeah, we talk about tools uh, every year on every conference, but uh, there's so much novelties that, yeah, uh, I'm interested in your, your take for as, as if for now. So uh, I've got three uh, of my favorite examples of, of people actually already using uh, AI, musical AI in creative ways. Uh, Two I've seen performed live, uh, and one is on YouTube. Let's start with the online one. There's this uh, online stream that's called Relentless Doppelganger. Uh, it's a st stream of technical death metal that's playing 24-7 since September 2019. So this is like the fifth year, uh, and it's on YouTube, and it's still playing. It's, it's, it's a five-year... Uh, for almost five years of technical death metal, and that's generated, if I'm not mistaken, by a neural network uh, called RAVE, which stands for Real-Time Audio Variational Autoencoder, trained on, on technical death metal. It's, it's a fantastic thing. It's, it's absolutely outrageous. Uh, I love it. Uh, but coming to the more like serious uh, examples, I've seen two examples played live uh, last year on, on Izmir in Milan. Uh, one was this performance using uh, an augmented guitar. It was called a hitar, as in hit guitar. Uh, so the guitar uh, had uh, a pickup that was run through a neural network that was transforming the sound of the guitar into tabla, the, the Indian percussion instrument, in real time. So there are some augmented guitar playing techniques where you, where you strike the guitar, etc. Uh, but they have like this woody percussive sound. This was like a guitar playing with a tabla, very deep, very interesting sound. And the guy played a composition that was created around this technology, absolutely beautiful. And the third example was on the same conference. Um, those were guys from the uh, Northwestern University in Chicago, I think. Uh, Professor Brian Pardo and one of his uh, PhD students, they played this improvised duet where Pardo was playing a saxophone and uh, Hugo was, uh, was running that saxophone in real time through a neural network that was kind of sampling and rearranging and morphing that saxophone in real time, kind of prompting Brian to play another phrase that was then replied to by the network, that was kind of replied to by uh, the, the, the live saxophone player. Uh, very interesting, very new way of communicating with an instrument, very new way of, of improvising, I think. And I think that these are the, the uh, examples that come to my mind uh, as, 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 as the first one that, that uh, someone's really using neural networks and their, and their uh, creative potential. Yeah, they wanna... Um, I mean, I use stuff so I compose. Um, I, I use Logic Pro. I know a lot of people have moved away from that, but I love it. Um, they have AI um, co-composers with you. So like a session musician that you can ask, like, oh, play bass, play it in this tempo. I do have to say, though, if you don't know music, it's, it's, it's good to the normal ear, but as a composer, you're like, I want to take that apart. I want to edit you. So that's definitely where it's sitting right now. It's... Can you hear me? It feels like I have to put it here for it to be amplified. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that is one thing. And then there's um, Output has an AI. It's called AI Co-Producer. And you will put it in and say, like any prompt, you'll say, like, oh, make me a spaghetti western. But the cool thing with this is it spews out stems. And for each prompt and song, it spews out something like, it's probably like 20 different um, stems. And for me, if I'm creatively blocked, this is great because I essentially will be like, oh man, that beat is amazing. I actually just want that two seconds from that. Let me reproduce that. And it's allowed me to be more creative when I'm not being creative. So it's really fun. And just back to your other point earlier of like, what's gonna happen with musicians. I think it's those sorts of things, the same with Instagram, the same with phones and taking like a camera phone it allows more accessibility across the world. Um, I have seen people um, on Boiler Room in Africa DJing using um, Tractor's app on their phone. And I know because I worked at Tractor then and they were like, what are they doing? That's not DJing. And I was like, no, they are using our product and DJing for Boiler Room in the middle of Africa because we have allowed them to do this. And I think that's what's going to happen. You're going to have musicians that otherwise couldn't be the same way you have photographers on Instagram that otherwise couldn't be photographers. And I think it will be beautiful. <laughs> uh, 
Christopher, do you want to talk about your product? Product? I'm interested. Uh, yeah, so I have I have two products that I uh, give out for free to artists. One is uh, a prompt library. So just imagine as you would log into ChatGPT, and when there's a new song that sh that you have as an artist coming out, there's there's always this questioning. Okay, how am I going to promote this? How am I going to connect to fans and find fans and win fans over? And it's not enough anymore. I think to just put a song on Spotify and hope for the best, because there's too many songs on Spotify every day. So what you need to do is you need to look into yourself and not do a post that says, listen to my song, but you need to do a post. If the song is about um, empowering someone that goes through um, bullying, then you say, I turned bullying into success because that's going to connect you to someone else. So what you can do is you log on to ChatGPT, you use one of the prompts. Uh, I wrote a four-week song release strategy prompt. So what this basically gives you is it's a four-week plan of empathetic, thought-provoking, educational content that you can use. And then you've got 16 ideas that you can directly uh, release. And uh, you got, well, what this basically does, it, it frees up more time for the artist to actually create because one of the things that I found is um, everyone is trying to break through the noise on social media and there's just, just so much noise so that wall becomes harder and harder to climb so if the artist can get the job done a lot faster with content and still make connections they'll have more time to put into you know what you would describe Robin I mean that's that's what I would love artists to to do to have the time to really experiment music with music. And I think a lot of uh, that is going away because everyone is under pressure of making noise on social media and winning fans. Sure. Yeah. As, uh, and as we have a lot of scientists and professors on the panel, <laughs> I'm curious, what is your take on the future tools? Like, is it, you know, uh, AGI or rather individual synthetic brains that everybody will have like in its pocket uh, that will just enhance their own creativity and um, and how about open source models and all the aspect of like national models that are there to uh, preserve the, the culture and heritage there is like multiple questions in one but uh <laughs> um, yeah Mateusz do you want to do you want to kick off yeah, so uh, I think we're going to see uh, this like curve of adapting these technologies in practice, right? I mean, uh, still, it's, it's also a matter of having a musician-friendly interface, right? I mean, language models got so popular because they have a super simple interface. It's, 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 it's like a chat interface. It's, 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 it's like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or whatever. It's very natural. And that's just not the way you interface with music. You interface with music through knobs, buttons, sliders, paper, instruments, etc., etc. right? You also uh, interface with music like through synthesizers, which are uh, electronic circuits, you know, like oscillators and filters, and all of a sudden it's, it, it turns out you need to have some uh, physics and electronics knowledge, yeah? And in the same way, I'm seeing already some, some uh, musicians that are kind of adapting some programming tools, like, like Python, which is a very simple, uh, simple to learn uh, programming language, uh, but I'm not sure whether we will have something like a foundational model for music or whether, whether uh, people will create their own individual models that were, will uh, augment their creativity. Uh, I think we'll just have to see. However, what I am already seeing is, uh, you asked about national models. Uh, what I'm already seeing in the field is increased interest in uh, mu not only Western music, because we have to say it out loud, like most of the research is done on what we consider uh, consider uh, Western music, like either European or American, etc. I'm seeing a lot of research done, uh, for instance, in Indian music, in Carnatic music right now. So it's 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 very exciting to see the music AI space expand to other cultures only than uh, the the Western musical tradition. Daniel, do you want to add? 
No, I, I think I think it's pretty pretty well summed up. I, I, but I, I do think that uh, one of the things that will be, you know, when we talk about uh, what is being access, which is also partly criticized with with not only uh, AI but but algorithmic uh, based music platforms, is smaller markets, more, smaller languages, and smaller cultures as opposed to bigger cultures and bigger bigger markets. So so that's probably also going to be. Uh, Maybe not the concern, but at least something that will be focused on by by smaller uh, communities and smaller cultures and identities. I think. And do you think it's important for for like national nations to uh, create like local models? Uh, we are seeing several happening in Poland. Uh, like in each country right now is is working on their own. Like, do you think it's it's important in terms of like, yeah cultural heritage preservation or or inclusion or diversity? To be honest, I don't see the importance of it right now because it boils back to what's it being used for. So, so what do we need it for? What is the, the purpose it serves? Uh, and I, you know, if it's for preserving culture, that's already preserved because you, know, you have the recordings and you have libraries and you have all the different... And then it's more about accessibility to it. So, uh, so how is that being accessible? Uh, but uh, but I think I think we first need to answer ask what is it we need it for. Uh, so what do, what's it going to be used for, uh, and then uh, see how it's going right. to uh, deliver on it. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, and obviously there is a lot of et ethical questions. Um, yeah, we're seeing a huge amount of. Um, uh, like lawsuits, copyright lawsuits right now, like I don't want to repeat all this, but um, uh, yeah, there is a need of uh, AI um, generated content li uh, labeling, um, uh, detection. Uh, yeah, we are hearing um, uh, acts like Elvis Act happening right now, just just uh, just introduced in, in the United States. So um, are there any other aspects, or have, are you seeing any any tools to you know um, address these issues? Or we are talking also about like the right to opt out, uh, and yeah, can we actually exercise this right, right, technically? And is it possible for a new neural network to forget something, for example? I mean, I, I would say it's 100% someone is allowed to opt out of this. It's, it's your data, essentially. Um, but you've got to contact those companies at the moment that are training models on your music and say, please don't use mine. But there are so many that you wouldn't know. They are training on whatever, one, on whatever they want because there is nothing in place for them to stop it. Um, I think there was um, Don who was speaking earlier today uh, from Delta. This is one thing to me is as a musician, I would say you should fingerprint your music and he's doing this with blockchain because then if they're using your music to train models and songs are generated using your music, you should be able to backtrack. And I think that's going to be happening in like a year or two where you're going to have these policies in place of what music did you train this on and if you don't know, you've got to wipe it all clear and start from the beginning. And if you're using these fingerprinted things, I think it's going to be better both for the people, the publishers, the creators, as well as the companies going forward. But these are all brand new things. At least this is my experience, but I don't know if the rest of you can speak for this. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. This is actually one of the most important things that, that you just said with blockchain. I think with blockchain, um, Gen Music AI that um, has been just released, they're ethically trained and they're using the blockchain. So whenever a new song is created, there's a, there's a, there's a, a digital certificate that is created for that song so that it can be, can be tracked. Um, and with models like Soundful, for instance, they're, they're doing collaborations with artists like Three Low. So whenever someone is using his model, he's getting, he's getting paid. And I think there, with blockchain, the, the opportunity that we have here is uh, artists can uh, front load revenue because we all know um, at least I remember um, when I was waiting for my my checks to come in I would <laughs> wait 12 months sometimes um, and I have an artist that I work with right now and he's waiting for uh, a PRS check uh, since 18 months for 
uh, supporting Robert Williams in front of 100,000 people, and he's still waiting for that. So, and that's not as uh, small, substantial money. So if he had the opportunity to front load, and this is what we need to look into, when there's um, music models being used that they're developed artist-centric, this is one of the values that we need to look for. So if, if a company calls, uh, talks about transparency, one of the core values, core brand values, needs to be artist-centricity, because um, developing these models with the artist in mind is going to make sure that everyone is winning, and that's, at the end of the day, what we all want. You know, we want artists to succeed, because see, seeing an artist succeed is the best feeling in the world. Just want to just to be just to be the the devil's advocate or being a little bit of an asshole. Uh, it's we. I mean, f only a few years ago, you couldn't go to any music conferences without discussing blockchain. Blockchain was the the most hyped technology, and it was going to fix everything. And then <laughs> it disappeared completely. And now we talk about AI. And and I find it fascinating that when we run into difficulties with AI, we bring blockchain in back in to to somehow fix it. And, and, and I agree, there are, there are elements in blockchain that are uh, really helpful, but I still haven't heard anyone explain properly how blockchain will fix that particular part, because especially if you bring in legacy catalog, if you bring in uh, older, uh, if you only work with new music, absolutely, I get it. Uh, but if you bring in legacy catalog and rights that you need to, <sighs> that are diversified over several markets, uh, then, and that's, that was always when blockchain came into difficulty back in the days, and I can't really see how it's going to you know, fix that part. I, I think we will need the blockchain, um, not just for music, but for uh, images. So there's, uh, there's a company that I work with, uh, they're called Numbers Protocol, and they do content provenance. So um, everything that you view online, may that be a deep fake or an image, it can be manipulated, and we would not know. Some people would not know, you know, like from intuition looking at it, you would probably know, okay, this, this cannot be that artist or someone is time, trying to scam me. So we need that labeling um, to, to tell us is that authentic content or not. And it needs to be um, a decentralized solution because, frankly talking, we do not want any entity in the world to control what uh, misinformation is and what is not. So we need a decentralized solution that can be run automatically without anyone interfering and being able to uh, alter any entry because on the blockchain, once it's on the blockchain, it's going to be there forever. Yeah, I think, um, so I've, I've done, uh, <laughs> when the whole blockchain thing came out, I was like, actually, I'm going to sit down and do courses on the technical side of this. So having done coding in my past, I was like, this can't be that hard. It is fucking complicated. And the reason why I bring blockchain up as much as this is like, oh, for fuck's sake, we're over that now. It was drones before. Um, is it gives you a digital fingerprint. So, yes, you have a backlog of songs. You need to make them digital. Firstly, you're not going to have this on a record. Mm. But you take a digital song. You can put a fingerprint on this that no one can edit. And when it gets passed on, when it gets manipulated, whatever happens, there is always a way to trace back what was that original thing? Where is that fingerprint and where is it coming from? And that is why I say blockchain because I'm like, this is the only thing I know of that can actually do that. Which I told you, the, the challenge is when, when, we, when we used to talk about blockchain back in the days, like in the old days of, of, of tech and, and music, uh, it was always linked to the GRD, the Global Repertoire Database, and how to fix, how to fix uh, data and registry systems. And, and whenever we talked about blockchain within that field or within that sphere, it always boiled down to, to complication when it came to figuring out how to deal with publishing rights, in particular publishing rights, not, not, not recording rights, but publishing rights. And very often publishing rights from the like, 50s, 60s, 70s, from old obscure publishing houses, especially in the US, uh, because of statutory damages and so forth. And, and uh, and that was still the challenge, because that was what the, uh, the GRD, the Global Repertoire Database, and the IMR, the International Music Registry, was supposed to fix and didn't fix. And that is still unfixed and unsolved. And that is still why you know, blockchain in some form is going to run into to problems. <laughs> well, we are turning it into blockchain conversation. I, I do. Well, I do know an blockchain artist. Panel. No, because you're talking about like the, the legalities. I know, an, I know of an artist. That some I think in 2000 and 
2011 or something, somewhere around there, I can double check, no, 2018, he was scared of plagiarism and he put blockchain on every single track that he created. So yeah, yeah. I think they're crazy people back then that were doing it and I think Delta now seems to be doing that, so yeah. Mateusz, I'm interested, um, because we talked a little bit before the panel, can a neural network forget? Yeah, Is it technically possible? Absolutely, neural networks uh, can forget what uh, they have been trained. I mean, uh, a neural network is, is a bunch of floating, floating uh, point numbers, right? Like millions or billions of them. And if you, it's, it's very difficult to pinpoint the particular clumps of numbers that make out like a, 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 a human understandable concept within a neural network. But by training on some specially curated data, you can uh, modify the, the, the neural network. Uh, for instance, you can make it forget something, but it's not the type of forgetting that, that you know, oh, I, I forgot my phone or I forgot, like, when is my friend's birthday or, or, or something, right? It's modifying, again, uh, we started from, from, from uh, stating that uh, neural networks create these internal abstract representations of, of knowledge, of data, right? You can kind of blur out a piece of that representation and th that's what we consider forgetting. But it's still pretty abstract, it's pretty vague. It's not like you train uh, a neural network on a huge catalog of music and you want to erase uh, Michael Jackson's Billie Jean out of that catalog. Like, per this particular song you're gonna for It doesn't work that way. We have three minutes left. Are there any questions? Oh, yeah, there's a question. Yeah. You want the... Thank you. I've got two questions. Um, Matthews, you mentioned that you didn't believe there would be, a fun maybe not, a foundation and model for music. What does that mean? Oh, um, well, uh, a foundational mu uh, model for like music generation and composition, right? But uh, we are already creating uh, what would be called foundational models uh, in music understanding. So uh, I'm going to compare it to language models like ChatGPT, right? Uh, the first stage of training a model like that is creating what's called a foundational model. And that's like training the huge neur neural network on these massive amounts of, of text data. This process costs millions of dollars, and what you end up is a model that has general understanding of language. Uh, so in this way, there are some attempts of creating um, foundational models for music understanding, but that's like, like just on the very beginning uh, of, of, of that kind of research. So basically, you, you, you want to have this huge neural network that kind of understands music in all of its abstract qualities, like, like genre, style, composition, etc. And then you can fine tune it, for instance, to become a generative model for minimal techno or something, right? But, but you start off with this huge thing that then you can uh, apply to, to, to further tasks. Okay. Um, second question, if this, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Gabby? Uh, you mentioned uh, the blockchain that you would you would like to track that to prevent from uh, your song to being reused reused for AI generated mu new music and so that you can be paid for that. Uh, that's that's the idea. I mean, uh, Rabbi. Oh, I'm sorry, Rabbi. That, that was that what we said. Sorry, um, but I if I understand correctly, the, the neural network they don't work that way. If if your data is going to be processed by a neural network um, and in the generative process there's no way to know if, if your which part of your track is at the origin of the creation of that new song so I, I, I don't understand how that's feasible am I right or completely wrong um, so I, I'm not actually a machine learning scientist but I have spoken to them and obviously I work in a company that does this and I've asked them and they said actually you can see what it is if you do that from the beginning if you're not doing that from the beginning and you want to now, so say if you have these lawsuits that are in place in two years' time that are like, right, we need to know what you trained on and what percentage is in the song 
they're like, okay, then we can't backtrack. But if we start with what we're doing, then we can put some sort of like digital fingerprint. And this is where the conversation was like, okay, well, what's the best thing to do it with? And this is as well why chatting to Don earlier, I was like, is this a crazy thing? He's like, no, that's what's actually happening and why people are doing that. So, but I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong because you've got two machine um, Okay. I know that Ma Mateusz Dates, yeah. research is more yeah. or less around this. Uh, well. I, have, I haven't worked with, with uh, blockchain music, but... Uh, yeah, but the explanation... Uh, and and I'm, I, I, I don't really know too much about blockchain. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a machine learning guy uh, and, and not really a... Yeah, a, but a can a you say how, how what's the percentage of certain like original uh, songs in, in the output song? Oh, uh, is, is it feasible right now when you generate something like using... Suno or something, is it possible to yeah. say it's like 10% Michael Jackson and 50% like uh, ABBA or, or something? No, no, at, 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 at this time, no. Well, then it kind of loses its point, isn't it, your question? Then it's... That, that, that was my question, yeah. is be, because of the way the neural network work, I mean, but I'm not, I'm not specialist either, so but so just trying to be, you know... Um, there is a company called Musical AI uh, that does a AI data attribution, so if they would, I mean, like you, like you said, if... If it was not done from the beginning, then it's going to be very, very hard. But so, but they come in to work with uh, data set providers to properly license, and if that is in place, then you would be able to say 10% Michael Jackson or whatever. Because it's the metadata essentially that's attached, yeah. But I think uh, I, I think uh, this was kind of my point again with with the blockchain and and what it's going to fix. And and I think uh, what we then end up with, what is probably going to be the easiest, is to simply blanket license it and to find a way how to split that money. Uh, and but that will also be difficult because you have major stakeholders who would not want to blanket license it. They would have they would want to individually. Uh, uh, negotiate uh, over the income, but that would solve it probably, and, and, and that's kind of the thing that we, there are models that could fix it uh, through bank, bank license and simply just coming up with a model on, on how to redistribute it. There was one more question over there, yeah, and we'll finish. The last question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you for that, this panel. Um, I got a feeling that it's still really a wild west right now, and um, especially, I think the the battle just begun uh, with the Jun you know uh, uh, sort of Suno story and you you Joe and I think well, <laughs> but but I got a feeling that it's against. US against China and we are here in, in, in Europe and little actor and uh, we I, I got the feeling that we have to wait <laughs> the battle between the bigs and the, the major company and everything and is it is, is it gonna be a barrier to, to, to little creator that we represent here that's I mean still the the, the law is not clear uh, is it gonna be um, because I don't know what I'm uh, what, what can I do uh, uh, nothing nobody even here is capable to explain to me yeah it's gonna be like this and you know like um, uh, like the DJs uh, it's easy because they they was using uh, sort of um, master owners uh, stuff so it was easy to to uh, say oh you you using my my vinyl so but it's not the case anymore, so we, we're not going to be able to, to trace and uh, do you reckon it's going to be a, a, a barrier to, to creator, for little creator? Yeah, I think that some of the creative models that we talked about uh, earlier, uh, they are widely accept, uh, accessible. They are, uh, and they're going to get more and more easy to use. Uh, more and more applicable, etc. Right now, this this model uh, that I referred to, that's called Rave, the real-time audio variational auto encoder. That's li like you can download that from GitHub and and run it on your laptop, and and and, and it's no problem. Uh, in terms of the huge models, uh, the road is being paved as 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 we're walking on it, right? I mean, musical AI is just such a smaller. Uh, niche than let's say computer vision, right? I, I mean, our phones recognize our relatives uh, in in the photos app, and nobody thinks about that as as artificial intelligence uh, anymore, right? And that's a convolutional convolutional neural network that's running in real time on on, on your phone, right? Um, I think that you know, 
lawyers uh i mean it's it's already difficult being a lawyer and like a copyright expert at the same time so now you have to be a lawyer a copyright expert a machine learning engineer and a lawmaker or something else at the same time to to discuss th these topics yeah, so bass drummer yeah and, and, and <laughs> yeah and, and like a drummer or bass player or, or, or yeah. something yeah <laughs> So uh, I think that as more people are, are, are going to get on board, uh, we're going to see more and more uh, solutions. But it's, it's f I think it's very important to kind of, um, you know, the, the huge models and the Suno and Udo, Udo stuff, that's one part, but there's tons of interesting stuff being developed at universities, by startups, uh, at hackathons, and by crazy creative people who are just, you know, uh, trying to, to uh, find new uh, ways of, of, of uh, musical expression. Right. Yeah, we don't have time to, to discuss more on this, but uh, I just want to uh, stress that there are so many interesting um, uh, like projects to collaborate between science and art and artists. Um, I, yeah, so it's it's great to you know look at this uh, uh, this direction also, right? And this has been the best audience today by far. No, that's awesome! A, uh, awesome! Awesome! Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for that.